The interfacial caging method is a method that allows for transferring large areas of graphene without using a polymer. The concept and details of the technique are described in the article shown on the screen. In addition to the articles, we also created this video as a supporting material to highlight the workflow and a few nuances that we found crucial for the transfer efficiency and eventual graphene quality. For the transfer, we first have to assemble the biphasic interface and graphene in it. For that, we place a sample of graphene grown on copper with a pre-edged backside on the surface of aqueous solution of ammonium persulfate. Then we add the cyclohexane phase. We only add a few droplets of cyclohexane just enough to cover the graphene surface and not a continuous layer. We found that it's the most optimal way of doing it. In this way, cyclohexane will not stick to the glassware upon freezing and will evaporate very quickly at the last step of the transfer and the sample will be overall easier to handle. The downside of having too little cyclohexane is that it can evaporate before copper is fully etched and leave the graphene unprotected. To preclude that, we can carefully add more cyclohexane after this first layer is frozen. For the next step, we put the sample in the fridge at 2 degrees Celsius and cover it with a lid because cyclohexane is very volatile. Melting point of cyclohexane is 7 degrees and of water is 0, so at 2 degrees cyclohexane freezes and water stays liquid. We leave it in the fridge for copper etching. It will take a little longer than etching at room temperature, but not very much longer. Here's one very important thing that we found. Freezing cyclohexane in the fridge is critical to provide a smooth interface due to more uniform cooling. We also tried freezing it in an ice box and it resulted in a rougher interface and eventually poorer graphene quality. So we stress that it's very important to put it somewhere where it can be cooled nicely and uniformly, in a normal fridge for instance. So for now we leave the sample in the fridge until copper is etched. Another important detail is that as soon as cyclohexane is solidified, it must be handled in cold to avoid melting. For that reason, while copper is still being etched, we put the tweezers, the target substrate in the petri dish and the beaker of water in the freezer. In such way, we make sure that they are colder than the cyclohexane. While the copper is being etched, we check from time to time if cyclohexane evaporated and there is a need to add more. In any case, it's always safe to add a few droplets on top of already frozen cyclohexane. We add them one by one, not letting them spread but rather thickening the cyclohexane layer. Typically, they freeze immediately. This addition step might be repeated several times depending on how quickly cyclohexane evaporates. After copper is fully etched, we replace the ammonium persulfate solution with pure water that we cooled down previously, in order not to have salt crystals on graphene surface. Having very cold water is critically important here, otherwise cyclohexane will melt. We do it in the uh, simplest possible manner, manually, slowly removing the uh, APS solution and adding pure water. You can do it in a smarter way with a pump, for example, as long as you make sure that everything stays cold. Now we're adding pure water. After the ammonium persulfate solution is substituted with pure water, we cover it with a lid again and leave in the fridge for another 10 to 15 minutes. It's very important to leave it in cold again because the cyclohexane might have partially melted during the water substitution and having the fridge open during that. 10 minutes in cold will allow it to freeze again. And then we do the transfer. We check the substrate, in our case it's a silicon wafer, and the tweezers that were preliminarily could cool down and fish the graphene with cyclohexane from the bottom.
This step can be done in many different manners, but we found this one the simplest and suitable for most substrate types. And as a final step, we remove the cyclohexane layer. For that we put the sample in an ice box. Actually, just leaving the sample as it is in the fridge will result in cyclohexane's full removal, because it's very volatile and sublimates into vapor from the solid phase. But we don't want to contaminate the fridge, and that's why we put the sample into a box with ice and leave it in the fume hood. Evaporation of cyclohexane typically takes from 20 minutes to 2 hours, depending on the thickness. This one will probably take about 20-30 minutes. If the cyclohexane layer is very thin, one can also let it melt. However, in that case, there is a risk that the graphene will be carried away with the liquid, so we prefer and recommend evaporating cyclohexane from the solid phase rather than liquid. In principle, there is no limitation for the graphene size that can be transferred to this method. Here, for example, we show a graphene sample that was transferred to a 4 cm silicon wafer. This sample will be further cleaned with a sequence of solvents as it is described in the paper.